The Apostle Peter says, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, let's begin this morning by singing a hymn of that great hope. It's number 775 in these blue books of ours. All my hope on God is founded. All my trust He shall renew. Number 775. Well, as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. We bow before you, the Lord, the God, upon whom all our hope is founded, God whom we trust, and we know we can trust because your power is above every earthly power. Your power shall outlast every human institution, every earthly glory. And so it is, and it always will be, our tower of strength, our rock, our great security in this life and through this life and into all eternity. 
You have been our provider, Lord, as we look back over our lives for so many needs, blessing us bountifully with so many gifts of your love, but above all, the great gift, the greatest gift of your own Son, by whom you are leading us steadily and safely to that eternal home in glory, the glory that we long to see revealed on the day of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we ask this morning that you would draw near to us as we gather together as your people. Receive our praise, Lord. Receive from us the love of our hearts as we gladly join our voices together in song and in prayer as we offer ourselves to you, all that we are and all that we have to be yours because you have first made us to be yours, your precious children. Fill our hearts afresh, we pray this morning with praise, praise that comes from a growing and a greater knowledge and love for you and for your gospel of gladness and joy, which we embrace and we love. Fill us, we pray, together with a confident joy that we may truly be people of hope, proclaiming a message of hope in this dark world. Thrill us afresh, Lord, with your truth and lead us in that truth and by that truth that in all the days of this coming week we may live that truth and speak it and proclaim it and show it to others by the words on our lips and also by the love in our lives. So here is our gracious God, our Father. We come to you in the name of Jesus, your precious Son, and ask all these things for his sake and for his great glory. Amen. Well, a very warm welcome indeed to all of you this morning. If you're upstairs here and uh, you can see uh, all of us here, or whether you're downstairs in one of the two rooms there, I can't see you, but I trust that you are being well looked after. It's good to see you here. And if it's your first time with us, you're very particularly welcome indeed. It is that time of year when, of course, uh, many new students are arriving in the city here, and it may be that that's you this morning. If you're here with us uh, as a new student or indeed as a returning student, then a very particular welcome back and uh, welcome to our church fellowship here at the Tron. If you pick up these uh, leaflets that I hope you have on your seats and have a quick look in there, there you'll see there are a number of notices, but uh, one of them is that on the top right there, you'll see that there is a student lunch taking place today in room five. That's the uh, downstairs large room on the left-hand side. So if you're a student and uh, you'd like to join us for lunch, we'd love to have you. Just uh, wait around a little bit after the end of the service for the chairs to be cleared and tables to be laid out. And uh, I'm sure that you'll enjoy a good lunch and a good opportunity to meet one another and uh, to share fellowship together. So do stay. We'd love to host you for that. Uh, if you're able to come back and join us this evening, of course, we have an evening service at 6.30. And uh, tonight, Edward Lobb will be preaching, continuing our studies in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. And again, after the evening service, there's always an opportunity over tea and coffee to meet and greet one another and to share and encourage one another in the gospel. If you look down the middle panel there, you'll see a number of things happening during the week. This week is our fortnightly congregational prayer meeting. We meet every second Wednesday uh, here as a church at 7.30, and we'd love you to come and join us as we pray, not principally for our own work here, although of course we do, but uh, for many partners in the gospel around the world uh, who depend upon our prayers. It's always a time of uh, encouragement and uh, hard work uh, as we pray together. But please do come and, uh, and join us. You'll see there there's various uh, student events and international events, and uh, I'll let you read about those. Uh, on the right-hand side, a couple of dates for your diary. Further on, you'll see the UCCF uh, training day in uh, October, and a number of you, uh, I hope, will be able to go through to Edinburgh and uh, enjoy that day of training in the Uncover materials that many of our small groups are going to be using this coming year. Then also, the following weekend, 25th, 26th October, we're ha having 
a Friday evening and a Saturday of a marriage seminar. Now, just in case you misunderstand here, this is not for those of you who hope to be married to come along and I will find a suitable spouse for you. If you'd like me to do that, I will do my very best. But uh, that's a different exercise. That's not what that evening is, although you never know what might happen. But it is an evening for, uh, not exclusively, but principally for married couples or those who perhaps are thinking about getting married, or maybe even those who ought to be thinking about getting married to come along and uh, learn about how to have a better marriage. I hasten to add, I will not be telling you how to do that, uh, except perhaps by, um, by um, learning from my mistakes, but uh, we will be learning together in a very, very good uh, presentation called Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage. So that tells you a bit about what the evening will be about. So put that date in your diary and uh, think about coming along. Well, I'm going to let you read the rest of these notices at your leisure. You'll see that there is one there about our harvest offering, and uh, you will be very familiar with the work at the River Kwai Christian Hospital, which we're seeking to help, and there's details there about how that can be done over these couple of Sundays at the end of this month. So do take that away with you, digest it, and uh, act accordingly. But we're going to turn now to our reading for this morning. You'll find that in the New Testament in The first letter of Peter, if you have one of our church Bibles, I think that's page 1014, 1014. Uh, If you have your own Bible, it's near the end, after Hebrews and James. We're looking this morning principally at verses 3 to 12 of chapter 1. We've just begun this letter, but I'm going to read down to verse 21. The introduction, as we looked at last time, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who are elect, chosen, but exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, all around that northern part of Turkey, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctification, the setting apart of the Spirit, and for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling with His blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, that your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls." Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Therefore, preparing your minds for action, be sober-minded, and set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, so also be holy in all your conduct." Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing 
that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like the blood of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for your sake, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Amen. And may God bless to us this, his word. We're going to sing the hymn on the screens now, which is a modern hymn all about that hope that we have and which we long for. There is a hope that burns within my heart that gives me strength for every passing day. Well, we have a few moments of quiet now as our musicians play and as our offerings for the Lord's work are received. I'd like to use the time to read again these words in First Peter that we'll be studying shortly. But as we do that in the quiet, our offerings are received.
Let's pray together. Our Father, as we bring these offerings before you, we're reminded of your great generosity to us, all the gifts that you have blessed our lives with, the temporal gifts of blessings abundantly in this world, the blessings of love, and of friendship, of family, the material blessings which we so easily take for granted in this country, but which confer upon us such privilege compared with so many in this world. And yet, Lord, above all, we thank you for the immeasurable blessings that are ours as the recipients of this full and final and marvelous revelation of yourself to us in the gospel of your Son. What prophets dimly saw and angels longed to fully understand and witness, we have received in the message of our Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you, Lord, for all that has been given to us, all that we have, and we ask that you would receive then from us all that we are able to give by way of response to this great gift of your grace. That we should be a people who not only in mind but in body and in substance should offer all that we are and all that we have to you to be tools in your hand willing servants of the gospel of Christ throughout this world, which is in such darkness and in such great need of the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. We think, Father, of the many parts of the world suffering the great darkness and affliction of war and civil turmoil and unrest, of oppression, where whole communities, whole populations live in slavery almost to dictators or to ruthless rulers who have no regard for the weak, the vulnerable, for the ordinary person. How fortunate we are, O oh God, in our land to know so little of the pain and the turmoil that this planet witnesses day after day after day. We think of places in the world that are constantly in our news, remembering the land of Syria. And we do pray, Father, that out of all the international diplomacy, the brinkmanship, the sparring of world leaders, which is in so many ways a testimony to the pride and the arrogance in the heart of man. Yet, Lord, we do pray that out of this, there might come good for the people of that land, that the slaughter might be diminished, that these heinous weapons of mass destruction might indeed be destroyed and removed from the conflict. We ask, Heavenly Father, that far more than that would be the outcome, that all the weapons that have killed 100,000 civilians in that land would cease to be used, that there might come a solution to that conflict by peaceable means. But we are not naive, O oh God. We know that where there is a will among wicked and ruthless men to destroy, to overcome, to conquer by force, that often the only way is for that force to be forcefully rebuffed. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would grant wisdom to the world leaders, to the diplomats, to the United Nations, to every government that is involved. Wisdom, a desire for real peace, but a willingness to do that which is sometimes necessary to bring real peace. We pray for the surrounding nations, Lord, and the whole area of the Middle East, so much in turmoil, not forgetting the land of Egypt and all the recent unrest there. 
Well, we do know, Heavenly Father, through the agencies such as Release International and the Barnabas Fund and others, what we do know is that in the midst of the maelstrom of political and civil unrest in these nations, it is so often our brothers and sisters in the Church of Jesus Christ who are most affected, most displaced, most disadvantaged. We pray, Lord, this morning for them, brothers and sisters with us in the family of our Lord Jesus, those with whom we shall spend eternity, but now suffering many, many grievous trials. We pray, Heavenly Father, that they would be strengthened by the same message that we will study together this morning, the message of the Apostle Peter, whose word is a word of true and everlasting hope, hope that is real, that cannot be defiled, cannot be extinguished, cannot be taken away, not by human sin or by evil or even by death itself, because it is sealed forever in the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we do pray, Lord, for present succor, for help, for encouragement, for relief, for dear brothers and sisters in Christ in the many lands of the Middle East where they've been displaced, from Syria, in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Iran, where we have so many loved ones. We ask, Heavenly Father, for your special blessing and peace to be upon your people in these lands. And so, Lord, we pray for our own land, so far away from many of these things, and yet, in another way, in just the same darkness, it's the same refusal of the light of our Lord Jesus Christ, and all the worse, and all the more calamitous, because we live in a land that has been privileged to have the open book, the open scriptures for hundreds and hundreds of years. Heavenly Father, we pray that through the power of your Spirit, through the proclamation of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, that book might once again become an open book more and more and more among the people of our land here, our city, Glasgow, our nation of Scotland, these islands of the British Isles. Grant every effort and every opportunity among the young people of the students and the colleges of our universities in Glasgow here this week and next, that as the Christian unions seek to bring the message of Jesus to new freshers and to returning students, that you would give them joy and gladness and confidence in your word, that there might be many who in turning to Christ find the light that is the light of their world and the light of the whole world. Help us, Heavenly Father, each one of us in our own lives, in our families, in our workplaces, with our neighbors. Help us, Lord, not to keep this light that you have given us hidden under a bushel, unseen and unheard. Grant us, Lord, that we might be a people who seek to uncover, as that new edition of Luke's gospel is called, uncover <coughs> the glory of Christ to a world that is so needy. So, Heavenly Father, we pray this morning for ourselves that you would humble us, that you would rebuke our sloth and our ease, that you would encourage us and strengthen us and equip us, Lord, to be the people that you have called us to be, who give a testimony to the God who called us out of darkness into light and whose inexpressible glories are to be lavishly shared with the people of this earth through obedience to Jesus Christ, your Son. Open our hearts, we pray, O God, for as this letter reminds us, it is with the house of God itself that judgment begins. So draw near to us. Teach us by your living word, we pray, and send us on our way to be the lights to this world that you have called us to be. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
We sing again a hymn on the screens before we come to God's Word, which is a prayer. Now in reverence and awe we gather round your Word. <coughs> Well, as we sit, perhaps you turn with me to the uh, reading that we had this morning in 1 Peter chapter 1. And um, let us indeed pray that in this Scripture we find light to chase the lies. Our title this morning is Authentic Salvation, as we focus here on the first part of uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, as we saw last time, that is the theme tune, the melodic line, if you like, that runs through this whole letter, the grace of God, the true grace of God, authentic salvation, as Peter calls it in chapter 5, verse 12. And he urges his readers to stand firm in this true grace of God and not to be led away into any error. And this true grace of God is that we who are in Christ, are both an elect people, as verse 1 says, and also an exiled people, strangers and foreigners in this world. And that is because we are an Easter people. We are the people of a Christ who was crucified and then rose from the dead. And that is the great paradox that Peter is addressing in this letter. 
It's a letter all about the glory that is ours with the glory of Christ. But authentic glory, according to Christ's true apostle, is Easter glory. Our Lord, the Lord of glory, is a crucified Savior whose shed blood is what sprinkles us and cleanses us from sin. And the glory of our salvation is the glory of His suffering and death on the cross at Calvary. And His true people are those who are chosen to share in Christ's true glory. And that's why it shouldn't surprise us that we also are called to share in the road to that glory, and that is the road of daily cross-carrying with Jesus in this world. Indeed, Peter says that we are to share in Christ's sufferings so that we may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed, when His glory will fill the whole world at the coming of Christ in glory. And so there is no other road to the eternal glory of Christ's kingdom than the road to Calvary, not for Jesus Himself, nor for any one of Jesus' true followers. This is the true grace of God. This alone is authentic salvation, according to Peter. Now, why does Peter need to emphasize so strongly these things all the way through his letter? Well, it's because his first readers then, just like us today, we live in a hostile world. They find themselves increasingly marginalized and estranged from the culture. They find being followers of Jesus very, very hard. And they faced a lot of opposition. They faced many trials precisely because of their faith, because they were Christians. But why? Why was God allowing them to suffer so much if they were so precious to Him? If God's Spirit was truly upon them? Well, it was easy, wasn't it, to wonder why that experience wasn't much more like, well, victory and rejoicing all the time instead of suffering and illness and pain and opposition. And no doubt there were, as we know, there were in New Testament times many teachers who came along and said, yes, well, we have the answer. We have the true message of the full grace and glory of God, and if only you'll listen to us, if only you'll come to our meetings, if only you'll listen to our special prophecies and revelations, well, we can offer you the gateway to that unreserved victory and glory, the end of suffering, the end of trials. We can point you to that triumph and blessing of a fully awakened spiritual inheritance, just what you're looking for. Now, friends, from Peter's day to our day, and according to Jesus Himself, until the very day of His coming in glory, there will be, as there always have been, false prophets and false teachers who come in Jesus' name and who will lead many astray with precisely those kind of teachings. They come in sheep's clothing, as we've been seeing in our Sunday night studies in 2 Corinthians, where Paul is dealing with exactly the same issues. They come full of language that sounds very spiritual, promising fullness and power and glory and blessing and the Spirit of God, a full gospel, a full experience, new supernatural revelation and all kinds of things. Interesting that they don't tend to come using the kind of language that Peter speaks of when he speaks of the true grace of God and what he says is authentic salvation. They don't tend to use the language of trial and testing and grief and sufferings and anxieties. They don't tend to talk about hope for a salvation that is in fact not yet and will not be ours until the day of Christ's coming, something we will see as very important for Peter. And so, as Christians today, we are just as much in need of Peter's apostolic realism which is a crushing blow to the dangerous fantasy that masquerades so often as Christianity in our world today, and which leads many naive and untaught young Christians, leads them utterly astray and into disaster. It's all around us in the church today. It's even right here in the city center of Glasgow. Just a few blocks from here, there's a so-called 
prophetic center where people who style themselves, and I'm quoting, as having a strong apostolic and prophetic anointing, where they offer to you, I quote, deeper healing ministry, and signs and wonders to help the church, quotes, take up their inheritance, note that word, take up their freedom now, promise you a new glory, quotes, more glory than we've ever seen in 2013. You can book an appointment for a prophetic checkup for yourself or for your business. It's recommended at least every two years. The minimum suggests a donation, 20 pounds. Apparently, there is such a demand for this that a new rapid-fire service has been introduced so that you can get a, quote, high-impact, powerful prophetic word within a few weeks of your applying. Now, it is a very slick operation. There's no amateurness about it. One of the leaders, we're told, and I quote, desires to see signs and wonders in every situation of life, particularly in the business arena, and he is an expert in marketing and new media and digital communications, and their website amply demonstrates that. And there was not a single space left to book an appointment for that when I tried. <laughs> for research purposes only. <laughs> What you can still book is for a conference called Partnering with Resurrection Power. It's a three-day conference next weekend, and it will, I quote, awaken our spiritual inheritance. Notice the word. It will unlock the gates of your future. And it will do so through an array of lady prophets and apostles from the USA and for Europe. I've rarely seen anything that smacks of such crass charlatanism. But no doubt, many naive and many needy Christians, and alas, others too, will be drawn in and will be taken in by it. What's additionally sad and has understandably upset some of you is that the venue for those events are Glasgow Cathedral, and yes, you've guessed at our former church building in Buchanan Street. Very striking, isn't it, how the extreme liberal wing and the extreme lunatic fringe of the church make such happy bedfellows, united as they are in the total absence of truth. So do you see why the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth, has preserved this letter from a genuine apostle of Christ to teach the church in every age what is the true grace of God? and what the marks of authentic salvation really are. It could not be more relevant to Glasgow in September 2013. Against all false claims, against all misunderstandings, Peter proclaims to us the truth of God's authentic salvation so that we won't be discouraged by the reality of life as believers in a hostile world, and so that we won't be deceived by those who peddle a false gospel, which is no gospel at all. And so the first section of this letter, verses 3 to 21 of chapter 1, is all about the immense privilege that we have as New Testament Christians, because we possess already the full gospel of the risen and ascended Lord Jesus. We know more, says Peter in verse 10, than all the prophets of old. And we experience something more than even the angels in heaven experience, verse 12. They're captivated as they look and see what is happening to us. And we have this, says Peter, because Jesus has now been raised from the dead. Notice the references to our living hope, which is through His resurrection. It brackets this whole section, verse 3. We're born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus. In verse 21, we are believers through Him who was raised from the dead so that our faith and our hope are in God. Our hope begins and ends with God, and it's focused on Christ who was crucified and risen. That is authentic salvation. And in this passage, Peter focuses on authentic salvation as both the great privilege of a living hope, the gospel which is fully made manifest to us, verses 3 to 12, and therefore also the responsibility 
for a lived hope, that is, the gospel fully manifest in us and through us, verses 13 to 21, because God's great covenant privileges always confer great responsibilities. Now, we'll come to responsibilities next time, but this morning I want us to concentrate on verses 3 to 12 and on the great privilege that we have in the full revelation of the everlasting covenant, which is now ours as we live in this New Testament era, this salvation which Peter describes as a living hope. And he tells us that we have the immense privilege of clarity, full clarity, on three vital things, which if we don't grasp, will lead us in disillusion and discouragement in our Christian lives, and which will leave us prey to deceivers who peddle something other than the grace of God, something that will not lead us to the true glory of Christ, but something that will in the end lead us into the path of the devil himself, whom Peter reminds us at the end of his letter is always prowling, seeking those to devour. So let's look at verses 3 to 12 and get clear what Peter makes absolutely clear about this authentic salvation, which is the living hope made manifest to us in the good news of Christ crucified and risen. First of all, in verses 3 to 5, he tells us that we have the privilege of a clear perspective on our salvation. And that is that it is a salvation reserved in heaven by God for us. Let's look at these verses, and you will see quite plainly, unequivocally, that our salvation is not yet. Authentic salvation in the New Testament is something which still lies in the future. I wonder if that surprises you. It may surprise you because we often use the language of salvation as something that we already have. We say that, don't we? Have you been saved? You might ask somebody, or you might say to somebody, well, I was saved 20 years ago when I trusted in Christ. Well, according to the New Testament, that is not so. Certainly, according to the Apostle Peter, that is not so. Yes, you have indeed been, verse 3, born again, if you have trusted Christ truly. He has caused us to be born again into a living hope, but hope implies something that is not yet. It's still in the future. The Apostle Paul says the same thing in Romans chapter 8. We are saved in hope. But clearly it's not hope, he says, if it's something we already see or have. No. We hope, says Paul, for what we do not yet see. And we wait for it with patience. It's in the future. What do we hope for but not yet see, according to Peter here? Well, look down at verse 4. An inheritance. Aha! A spiritual inheritance to be unlocked. That's what the UK Council of Prophets says we're to take up now, without delay, and no more glory in that inheritance than we've ever seen before this year. That's what will be awakened and unlocked for us if we will participate in resurrection power. Well, Apostle Peter, what do you say about this inheritance? Verse 4, it's imperishable. How wonderful. It will be untouched by death. It's undefiled. How marvelous, it can't be spoiled by sin, and it's unfading. What joy, it won't ever fade away with time. It is indeed a full and a complete salvation, the salvation and the glorifying of our whole bodies, our souls, as verse 9 puts it. That is our whole being. The word soul there is not uh, in the Bible, it doesn't mean what we often use it to mean, meaning the sort of uh, the non-bodily part of us. In the Bible, that word soul means the whole of us, body, mind, and spirit. It's our whole being in every part. That's certainly how Peter uses it several times in this letter. For example, in chapter 4, verse 25, he says, we have returned to the, the shepherd and the overseer of our souls, our whole bodies. He means we've come home to God as our good shepherd. The shepherd tends and feeds real bodily sheep, not the spirits of wistful sheep wandering around in the atmosphere. But that is our real 
inheritance through Christ's resurrection, Peter says. That is our authentic salvation. It is our complete, renewed, restored humanity in real physical bodies which are imperishable and undefiled and unfading, untouched by death and any sickness, unstained by evil, unimpaired by time, as one writer paraphrases verse 4. The very things that, that do destroy and wipe away all of our earthly hopes, just, just like Jesus said in Luke's gospel, chapter 12, the moth and the rust, the thief, the aging money bags. But that will be banished forever in our true salvation, says Peter. What a great salvation that is. I want that salvation, don't you? I want to partner with resurrection power and have that unlocked to me. Complete bodily healing. Complete freedom from all the, the touch of sin and its taint in my life. Complete release from all the suffering and evil in this world. And there are many self-styled apostles and prophets and others today who will say, yes, and we have the key that will unlock all of that to you now, today. But you see here, Peter, Christ's true apostle, says something quite, quite different. That inheritance, that salvation, he says, is yours. It belongs to you already, but it's kept for you by God's power. Where? Verse 4. It's being kept in heaven for you. That is, it is not yet yours to possess bodily on this earth. When will it be revealed to us to possess fully on earth? Well, verse 5. It is a salvation, he says, ready to be revealed in the last time. Not yet. In the very last day of time, which is, according to verse 7, do you see? At the revelation of Jesus Christ. If you don't quite get that, he repeats that again in verse 13. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Genuine salvation, biblical salvation, as taught by Christ and his apostles, is not yet. Because salvation lies on the other side of God's judgment on the last day. Salvation is rescue from that judgment and from God's wrath and from its penalty of everlasting death. And therefore, salvation on that day is a rescue through judgment that will lead into everlasting bodily life in the new heavens and the new earth. And so it can't possibly be ours before that day. Because God's eternal glory, His kingdom of glory in Christ must be revealed. It must fill the whole cosmos before we can live in it. Stands the reason. And only that is authentic biblical salvation. Anything less than that is just a parody of this true salvation, this full inheritance that is promised to us in Jesus. Authentic salvation is not yet. But it is, nevertheless, certain. There is an already about our salvation. And that is that already, says Peter, we have a living hope. That is, we have a certain assurance of this promised future. We've already seen in verses 1 and 2 last time that God's people are already chosen and set apart for that salvation by His Spirit and sealed by Christ's blood into this everlasting covenant, this unbreakable bond. And as verse 3 says here, our hope is made a living and a certain hope through the fact of Jesus' resurrection in history. It is His resurrection and His ascension to glory that guarantees His return to reveal that glory to the whole world forever. So our hope is living. It's alive. It is absolutely rock-solid certain. It's important to understand that is what hope means in the Bible. It is absolutely not the kind of hope that says, well, I hope the weather today will be dry in Glasgow. I tell you, that is a forlorn hope, friends. And if you are new to our city, you will discover that very soon. 
Biblical hope is a totally different thing. It is a certainty because it rests in the promise and the power of God, whose purpose never fails. This inheritance, this salvation is, verse 4, kept for us by God. And verse 5, he says, we are being kept, we are being guarded for this salvation also by God. He's keeping the inheritance for us, and he's keeping us for that inheritance. So it can't be messed up, it can't be lost by us. You parents all know when you take your children on holiday, you keep their ticket and you keep their passport for them so they don't lose them. And you keep hold of them too so you don't lose them either. And only by keeping hold of them and keeping hold of their passport will you reach your happy holiday destination and the sunshine and the seaside. Not just so with our own heavenly Father. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his mercy, he has caused us to be born again into a living hope, to an inheritance kept for us, who by God's power are also being kept, guarded through faith, for a salvation to be revealed at the last time. A clear perspective on authentic salvation from the apostle of Christ, a true apostle we can trust. And friends, don't we need to know this, this living hope? It's impossible, isn't it, to live as a human being without hope. Hopelessness in our personal life, in community life, in cultures, in national life. Hopelessness leads to despair. It leads to to disease. It leads to death. The tragic fact, isn't it, of our hopelessness in society today that the chief cause of death among young men in our country is suicide. Human beings need hope because we're made for eternity. God has set eternity in our hearts and therefore we can't avoid as human beings the quest for a future, for hope. We can't avoid it. It's part of our makeup. That longing for something more, for for significance, for meaning, for life, more than, than life seems to be. But you see, if the hope of heaven, if the genuine salvation the Bible speaks of in the kingdom of Christ's glory, the glory to be revealed at His coming, if that living hope is not man's hope, And inevitably, human beings will have to manufacture some kind of hope, trying to build heaven on earth here and now. Friends, that is only ever going to be a dead hope because it means investing your life in things which are perishable, which will be defiled, which will fade away inevitably with time. But that's what people do. Many people do put their hope in the perfect marriage, even talk, even though they're not religious, about a a match made in heaven. It's ironic, isn't it, as one of our politicians said recently, never has there been a time when weddings have been more expensive, but marriage has become so cheapened. And how quickly heaven turns to hell when marriage has been your great hope for life. The tragedy of the divorce statistics and shattered families is hellish, isn't it? Many set their hopes on their careers or perhaps on the wealth that that might bring or on on health and on beauty and fitness and all of these things, but how, how fleeting, how perishable all these things are. Or think of the great hopes of, of cultures and societies promising heaven on earth. Think of Hitler's promise to the German people of the great thousand-year Reich, or Karl Marx and the utopianism of communism. Did that produce heaven on earth? Hell on earth, more to the point. What about the Arab Spring and the great hope for the future? Well, how long has that lasted in Egypt today? What about the glorious hope of the Eurozone? 
But we have a true hope, a certain hope, a real salvation, untouched by death, unstained by evil, unimpaired by time, an inheritance of true life, life as it is meant to be, life in all its glorious fullness. Not yet. So you mustn't be taken in by false prophets, by counterfeit apostles who do promise health and healing and sinless perfection and all sorts of heavenly glory now. False hopes, friends, placed in those kind of things fade so quickly into despair, into disillusion. And so often also I find to end in taintedness and sin and scandal of all kinds. But our true hope is certain. It is kept for us by God, and it is coming with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you need to know that when you're struggling as a Christian, maybe facing abuse or insults in your school class or your college dorm or wherever it is, or when you're struggling with sin and failure in your own life, or when you're, when you're suffering whatever kind of grievous trial it may be, this is not as good as it gets, as Jack Nicholson declares in the film of that name. No, it's not. And one key reason why we need to meet together weekly as believers, as a church, is to remind ourselves of that great hope, to get a glimpse of it as we look around at one another and we see God's power at work keeping other Christian believers, old and young, keeping them in the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ for the glory that is to come. We have a privilege of this clear perspective on our salvation, a salvation reserved in heaven by God. But you might say, well, what do we have now as born-again believers in Christ of our salvation is future, if it's not yet ours, if it's, if it's not yet our possession? Do we experience nothing of that glorious salvation now? Well, Peter's answer lies in verses 6 to 9. And he says, we do have a very full experience now, an experience both, both of joy that is inexpressible and of pain. It may often seem inexplicable unless we grasp this second point of his, that now we are privileged in that we see a clear purpose in our suffering. We see a clear purpose in our suffering, and it is a suffering that is refining us now for a glory that we will share with Christ. Look at verses 6 and 8. They go together. They both express, don't they, what we know to be true experience in the real world, in our Christian lives. Notice the now in both of these verses. Verse 6, now we are rejoicing in this great salvation, and yet we're also grieved by various trials. Verse 8, now we don't see Jesus revealed as we long to do. The bridegroom has not yet returned. And yet, he says, even now... We believe in him and we rejoice with joy inexpressible. Now, doesn't that describe the real Christian life? Not some fantasy pretend life of joy without pain, of, of rejoicing without shedding tears, but the reality for all of us who know the Lord, who love the Lord and rejoice in the Lord, and yet who have eyes and ears and feelings and we know just as well as everybody else that we live in a fallen world, a world under the curse, a world that is not yet fully perfect. We're longing for His coming, and the joy and the pain are both there side by side, day after day. Grief and glory are the two sides of the same coin in healthy, balanced Bible Christianity, Christianity in the real world, and the real gospel. And we need to keep hold of both sides of that coin. Otherwise, we will end up totally unbalanced in our Christian faith. 
if we think that we should always be up and always be rejoicing and never feeling down, then friends, when you do experience griefs, when you do experience trials, inevitably you will think, well, there must be something wrong with me, something wrong with my faith. Or on the other hand, just always being morose and depressed and and never able to rejoice at all in that wonderful living hope that is ours. And we've got to hold both of these things together. That's the real life of faith. It's not just that we're to hold these sides of our Christian experience together. We're to understand what Peter is actually saying about the purpose of these grievous trials. Why do we rejoice, verse 6? It's not just that grievous trials are for a short time, but the glory to come will be eternal. That is true, and that should cause us to rejoice. But it's much more than that, do you see? It is that these grievous trials are the very thing that are working glory in us for eternity. Look at verse 5. We are being guarded through faith for this great salvation. That is how we will ultimately possess our full salvation, only if that faith endures to the end. That's what Jesus said. The one who endures to the end will be saved. And in this, you rejoice, says Peter. Well, in what? Look at verse 7. In the knowledge that these trials are the very thing working in us to purify that faith, just as gold is purified in the fire, and to prove that that faith is true and genuine. So that, do you see? So that it does result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that's why even now when we don't see yet Christ's glory, we love him and we rejoice with this joy so inexpressible. We rejoice in what he is doing in us and for us even through these most grievous of trials. Because, verse 9, the outcome, the outcome of all this refining in our lives by faith will be our full salvation. We are obtaining the inheritance that still lies in the future through what is God is doing in us now in our earthly pilgrimage. It's God's purpose working all these things for our good. It's not the evil purpose of others or even the devil himself that is winning out here. He is prowling all the time, Peter says in chapter 5, looking to see whom he can devour. But no. It's Genesis 50, verse 20, all over again, isn't it? What evil men meant for evil, God purposes for good, for working out a great salvation. It's through all of this in our lives that he is restoring and confirming and is strengthening and establishing you for eternal glory. And so we can rejoice because we know the clear purpose of our sufferings. They're refining us now in the hands of a master craftsman for glory that will be everlasting. I have a cousin who is a triathlete, and uh, some time ago we were on holiday together, and she was training for an Ironman. Now, an Ironman race, you begin by swimming 3.8 kilometers, you then cycle 180 kilometers, and then you finish off with a 26-mile marathon for good measure. And the training schedule of that, you can imagine, is grueling. And she had a personal trainer who laid it all out and who enforced it. Every single day. Now, friends, I can tell you, somebody who made me do that, I would hate with a bitter hatred. (laughs) But she loved him, and she trusted him, and she obeyed him because he promised her. And he said, I know that if you keep to this, you will certainly complete that race, and you will receive the medal. And she did, and she did. See, doesn't it make all the difference in the world to know the purpose and indeed the privilege 
of the grievous trials that come into our life for Jesus' sake. That it is all obtaining the glorious goal of our faith, the salvation of our souls, the salvation of our whole being. It doesn't make a difference to know, as the hymn says, that His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. We know the purpose of our sufferings. And finally, in verses 10 to 12, Peter tells us that we who have the privilege of the full gospel made manifest to us, we have the assurance that we share in the clear pattern of the Savior, a pattern that's revealed consistently through the prophets of the Old Testament and now completely in the apostolic gospel of the New Testament by the same infallible witness of the Holy Spirit himself. You see, he's saying this pattern of salvation is the authentic biblical salvation through and through. It's a consistent message. Verse 10, this is the salvation that the prophets spoke of, and they knew it was a salvation still to be fulfilled and fully revealed only in the time of Christ's coming in the future. And this is the salvation, verse 12, that is now announced in the good news of the apostolic gospel. There has only ever been one message of authentic salvation from the Holy Spirit of Christ. He predicted it through the prophets, and he proclaimed it through the apostles. But now it is a complete message. It's to you that this ultimate understanding has come. Many prophets long to see what you see and hear what you hear. That's what Jesus said. That's what Peter's saying here. And even the angels have been longing for this time. And it's come in your experience with ultimate clarity. What is this consistent message of the prophets now complete in the gospel of the New Testament? Well, it's there in verse 11. Do you see? It's the message of the sufferings and the subsequent glories of the Christ. That is the pattern of the Savior. And that is the pattern of all authentic salvation. Peter is telling us, says John Calvin, that from the beginning the cross has been the way to victory, death the way to life. Now, this has been clearly testified through all the Scriptures. Just read your Bible. From beginning to end, you'll find there there's a recurring pattern all through the Old Testament, all the true people of God suffered. They were oppressed and scorned and ill-treated by their fellow men. Enemies abounded. And yet even more inexplicably, apparently, at the hand of God Himself. Think of the psalmist cries, How long, O Lord? Why, O Lord? Think of the afflictions of Job. Many others. Now, the Old Testament, of course, gives some answers to these agonies, but even the prophets who knew that they carried the infallible word of God's Spirit, even they knew that they glimpsed only partially the full answer to it all. They knew that God's people suffered for Him. They knew also that those most intimately associated with God's plan and purposes often suffered the very most. Think of Joseph that we were studying. Think of David, the anointed king, and all his enemies. But now, says Peter, we, we see it so, so clearly. This pattern of suffering for God's most faithful people, it mirrors the pattern of God's own precious Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He was glorified only through suffering. Those faithful ones suffered just because they belonged to that one who was to come, who would walk the path of suffering on his way to glory. Just as now, as Paul says elsewhere, we too have been granted not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. But that's always been the pattern for the people of the Christ. 
whether to those who belong to him through the promise of the Christ who is to come, or like us, who have the privilege of trusting in the Christ who has come. We have that privilege to see it all so much more clearly. The prophets dimly saw it. They pointed and predicted the subsequent glories and the suffering of Christ. They saw that pattern. They saw it sometimes very clearly, just as Isaiah did in Isaiah 53, which Peter quotes several times in this letter. But they also saw that there was more. They knew what they didn't know, the time and the circumstances. But they knew it was coming. But Peter says, we We've seen it all. And the Holy Spirit came upon the church at Pentecost specifically to bring that full and final witness of God's authentic way of salvation through Christ alone to the whole world. So we know the full wonder that is to be ours in Christ, a share of His everlasting inheritance of glory. We also know the true privilege, the incredible privilege that God has chosen us to be united to His glorious Son, that we should be made glorious exactly the same way that He was made glorious. That is, God exalted Him through His path of grief and suffering through the cross So also for us, in sharing in His sufferings as we bear our cross, He is leading us to receive our crown. We share in the pattern of the Savior because there's no other pattern by which God can make us like Him. And so Peter says to us this morning, friends, this, and this alone, is authentic salvation. And so even amid griefs and trials, we can rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory because it is in this way that we are receiving the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our whole being which is forever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the inheritance that is ours but is kept so guardedly and so wonderfully for us in your hands. So will you keep us, guard us, purify us, and prove us that on the day of the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, we all here this morning might be found to result in praise and glory and honor. Amen. Well, we're going to sing to finish, and we're going to sing again number 783, which we sang at the beginning last week, but we're going to sing it at the end this week to a different tune. Blessed be the everlasting God, the Father of our Lord. His boundless mercy now be praised. His majesty adored. Saints by the power of God are kept till their salvation come. We walk by faith as strangers here till Christ shall call us home. Number 783.
So now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all now and till that day. Amen.